Thanks for that. In such a short time, we've seen so many developments in social media and online communication. It's hard to believe it's just four years since Twitter launched with just a handful of employees. It now has more than 175 million users worldwide. So where is social media and micro, micro blogging heading? And what other exciting or scary developments in technology <laughs> can we expect? Our guest is author, futurist and virtual reality guru, Mark Pesci. Welcome to The Drum, Mark. Thank now, you, now that everybody's got a Twitter account and a Facebook page and a hacktivist uh, counter-identity, with all this information sloshing around out there, how do we know who to believe? Well, this is the good question. I mean, I, I encountered a problem a couple of weeks ago. I was in the supermarket and I needed to find cornstarch so I could make my Thanksgiving turkey. And I threw this out because I couldn't find cornstarch in the Australian cabinet. And I'm lucky that someone came back. In fact, I think it was you. It was me. <laughs> it's called cornflower here. Loser. And that someone said, oh, no, mate, we call it rat poison in Australia. Oh, hilarious. All that right. Was... You know, and the, the, so we, we were coming to this point now. The more we depend on social media to find the references to sort of make our way in the world, the more we need to forge those bonds of trust and the more that if those bonds of trust aren't present, then that world can just suddenly sort of fall out from underneath us. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to need to find some way to be able to manage if you have 20,000 connections or if you have a gazillion connections. <laughs> um, we need to be able to find a way to be able to reinforce those connections so that we're not walking always on, you know, feet of clay. But how does that work when you um, look at the individual operating in a society? I mean, how do you work with concepts of global security, information security, um, when you're talking about establishing networks of trust? How do you do it on a grand scale? Yeah, I mean, right now, particularly in the last two weeks, what we're going to see is everyone getting a lot more paranoid because right now governments have realised all of a sudden that the citizens have a lot of power they didn't have and the citizens realise that the government has a lot of power they didn't think it had. And so there's going to be this negotiation Negotiation about what am I going to, the government's going to say, well, what am I going to let you get away with? And the citizens are going to say, well, what am I going to let you get away with? And we're just at the beginning of this. This is something that we just stumbled into, and all of a sudden we found ourselves in this vast room, and there's a lot of very big red buttons which say, don't press this, because if you do, you're going to blow everything up. And everyone's sort of looking around going, well, what happens if I press those red buttons? So this is, I think, the beginning of a conversation, and the conversation really starts with the recognition that we're all very vulnerable. So do you think governments are going to relax a bit about information when, once they realise that organisations like WikiLeaks are steadfastly loosening their control over it anyway? I mean, you'd want that to happen, and you're optimistic point of view. You want that to happen. You want the governments to go, oh, well, this is the tenor of the times. Let's just open up me. But I have a feeling that they're just going to become more sclerotic and more closed in. You can already see the military shutting down. Uh, the U.S. military now doesn't use, let you bring a USB stick into any of their facilities in case someone else takes out 250,000 cables again. So you can still take a Lady Gaga CD in, obviously. I mean, Presumably, I'm or, about it. or you could probably, you know, figure out if you have some fancy f uh, s uh, software on your cell phone, just send it via Wi-Fi. I mean, there's more and more and more holes opening up even as they try to close the holes that have already been used. When, when this kind of stuff first happened when it came to digital music, mm. when it opened up and everything was free all of a sudden, the first thing record companies did was start to send out what they called spoofs, which were fake files yeah. that people would download and they'd think they're real, but then they'd realize, oh God, and it would just destroy the whole market. That was their theory. Can you see the same thing happening here where people deliberately send out misinformation to try and destroy Twitter as a network? Yeah, I mean, we're already seeing that. I think there's now now, just in the last couple of days, we've seen all this disinformation around WikiLeaks popping mm. up, and now there's a real info war going on about is Julian Assange what he claims to be, is WikiLeaks what mm. it claims to be, what's the powers behind all of this? And the more that you can muddy the waters, the more you do dilute the story. Mm. And I think that's part of what we're going to see playing now. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay. In, t in terms of those muddying the waters th th that you speak of, how can they be unmuddied? How do we make the waters clear? Is there, I suppose, is there a continuing role for media organisations as almost like a, an intermediary there, or is it just uh, some other way that it's going to become clear? Well, it beca I mean, it, again, it comes right back down to trust. I, I will never trust the New York Times again because Judith Miller lied about the war in Iraq. All right. I will never. I will trust the ABC for as long as Annabelle doesn't lie about giving me rat poison. Or <laughs> 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 
reliable on the cauliflower front. I think you'll so, call. So, so I think that's it. I think that media organizations will then have to use social media as the way to create and reinforce those bonds of trust. And the organizations that do that, The Guardian obviously is doing it very well. The ABC is now doing it with Latika becoming the social media sort of emissary for well, the speaking, ABC. Speaking of whom, Latika, I'm anxious not to exclude you from this little Twitter off. Um, do you have an observation or a question for Mark? I, I definitely agree about the trust that you raise, Mark, because uh, an extraordinary thing started happening to me after both the spills. People would, would mention me about stories that other people had published and say, is this true? And I was hmm. kind of like, well, that journalist has published it. Um, check it out for yourself. But then I realised that they actually trusted me so much that they wanted me to go and verify it and they would only believe it if I told them. And, and I thought that that was a really strange development. And I think that, uh, yeah, it just comes down to trust, doesn't it, online, because there's so many people you distrust. For the record, Mark, you can't trust me. No, and I knew that. <laughs> That's why I didn't even bring you up. I've never trusted you, Chaz. Good. Excellent. <laughs> but, but, but this is the whole point. If you become the trusted source, that then becomes your stock in trade. You know, that's the thing that you as an individual or you as a media organization, that's the thing that you have going into the future when we have so many possible sources of, sources of information, all of which are somewhat valuable, but only some of which you have that strong trust relationship with. Look, let's talk about um, the risk of, of, of info warfare now because, I mean, the WikiLeaks situation is getting quite mad, isn't it? Because we've got Australia versus Assange, USA versus Assange, WikiLeaks versus everywhere, Sweden playing, you know, a kind of a running interference role. Right. Then you've got pro-Assange hacktivists and anti-Assange hacktivists. It's this incredible scrimmage, you know, and it's difficult to know who's fighting whom. Right, exactly. And that's, I think, part of the... Part of the the nature of info war it's you know even before you start fighting the truth goes out the window and truth is not the first casualty of this war truth was the pre casualty <laughs> to this war and and so what we're going to see now we don't know who's behind say anonymous i mean we think you know that's just uh, just anonymous people, anonymous citizens. We don't know who's behind Operation Fight Back. We don't know if the state actors, because we know that all of the major powers have strong info war capabilities, we don't know if they're out there sort of testing their tools right now. Oh, does this work? Oh, does this work? I can have some cover here to find this out. We, we simply don't know this. We Maybe can suspect you're it. Maybe you one of them, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Do you trust me? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I, I'm, um, I'm waiting to be invited around to your house to see your cooking with the, uh, with the flour <laughs> recommendations. Slash rat poison. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, one other thing that I really uh, want you to terrify us with, uh, Mark, is, uh, is, is your predictions about the way uh, the computer world may start to observe human right. beings. I believe you have an update for us well, on that. Well, yeah. Skynet. <laughs> it's even better. Microsoft introduced something very innocuous a few weeks ago called the Kinect. It's a little device that slaps onto your Xbox 360 and it watches you. And it doesn't just watch you, it watches you in three dimensions. So for the first time, there is a three-dimensional camera. Now that's selling faster than iPads are right now. For the first time, Microsoft has invented something that's blown the doors off of everyone in the world. Microsoft is not known for inventiveness. They're known for being very good salespeople. But they've actually hit one so far out of the park, no one knows where the ball is going to land. In five years' time, every tablet that you have, every computer that you have will have some version of this in there, and the computer will be watching you. So it'll be watching your mood. It'll be watching your your posture. It'll be watching you and maybe reporting to your superiors. <laughs> exactly. Or maybe it'll just all be feeding into some sort of AI somewhere. And to what end, Mark? I mean, why is this computer going to be gathering material? I, I, at the best, in the pos best possible world, it's to increase the relationship. If you think about the fact that we actually have intimate relationships, almost emotional relationships with our computer, it would be a good thing if the computer could sort of help you calm down because it notices you're agitated or perhaps you need to be focused and you're all over the map, and it can help you do that. The more that it watches you, the more it can help you do that. Computers have not been able to do that. They can do that now. I think it's a <laughs> bit disturbing to think of computers watching you, given that most of the internet is used for porn. <laughs> Put those two together, it's a very unsavoury picture. <laughs> I think it's very disturbing to have uh, the idea of a computer relaxing you. Every computer I've had <laughs> frustrated me so much I smashed it on the wall. <laughs> and the idea of Microsoft, you know, actually inventing a relaxing computer is kind yeah. of a little bit alien to the process, isn't it? <laughs> but isn't this um, partly an identity tool as well, that you're 
your computer oh, yes. starts to learn your characteristics, the Absolutely. way you, your posture is, so that it can tell when somebody else is trying to use it. Is that an aspect of it? The longer that you interact with it, the better the model it builds up. So it will be able to tell immediately whether someone is you or not because they can, they can maybe fake your fingerprint. They might be able to fake your voice. They won't be able to fake you. And that's really what the computer started to capture. So you mean we, we may be a heartbeat away from the uh, the drunk detector that stops people <laughs> from tweeting when intoxicated. Well, look, no. that's all for the drum this afternoon. I'm afraid we're right out of time. We could have talked about this for hours, but uh, thanks to all of our guests, including Latika in Canberra, welcome. You can check out the website at abc.net.au forward slash the drum.